and second to last, uh, we have Bryce Van Ross, who joined us this year um, from CSU LA, where he's going to be a rising senior. He's been working this summer with uh, Johanna, uh, studying uh, Gaussian processes and how they can be used in order to improve exoplanet detection methods. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, hello, everyone. Again, my name is Bryce Van Ross. It's been a pleasure working here at Carnegie Observatories with Dr. Johanna Tescu. So a major difficulty in detecting exoplanets is disentangling stellar signals from the actual planets themselves. To help solve this pro the puzzle, uh, we applied Gaussian processes analysis techniques to signals that we know actually co come from the stars. This technique is actually a relatively new uh, application in the field of astronomy. So before I begin to talk about the details of the work, I am actually going to discuss motivation. Uh, so far to date, there have been over 3,000 planets detected outside of our solar system. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of focus on M dwarfs um, and the planets around them uh, on the basis that a lot of them consist of small planets, Earth-like planets, and most notably that um, they have potential in terms of being habitable. Uh, by that, I mean uh, that they would contain uh, sustain liquid water on their surface um, surfaces. Um, so nearby small planets are the best places to look for that ha habitability, but because they're so small, they're actually really hard to find and to characterize. Um, planets are hard to find also because we detect them indirectly. We have two primary methods, the transit method and the radial velocity method. Uh, for our research, we're actually focused on the latter. Um, regardless of the method, however, small planets are still hard to detect on the basis that they show few physical effects. Uh, for the RV method, there are two major challenges. The first is that our current instruments are not stable enough. So in regards to RV variation, some of that might actually just be instrumental. Um, however, our technologies seem to be improving within the next five year time span to accommodate for that. So our second challenge, however, would be the stellar activity. Uh, the stellar activity uh, I'll refer to as noise and discuss how Gaussian process is a way to understand such stellar noise. So here we see different types of stellar activity here. All the types, oscillation, flares, granulation, et cetera. Um, and their impact are RV in, on RVs are in color uh, at these measurements. Whereas in white, uh, we have typical time scales of, um, the stellar, of each type of stellar noise. The typical instrumental precision is just under a uh, meter per second, which is basically where stellar noise starts to take primary effect. Once instruments are actually able to be within that precision, however, uh, most air and RVs will be uh, shifted towards uh, the stellar noise I was speaking of. So it's imperative that we actually understand such uh, stellar noise in order to detect uh, planets. So right here, uh, we have, if I could grab the other, uh, we have uh, a NASA movie of our sun. As we could see, it's actually very active, very dynamic. Um, but again, the emphasis is our limit in terms of how, we, how well we actually understand the stars and their activity. So with these issues in mind, uh, we have Gaussian processes um, to help solve that puzzle. Uh, GPs have been applied in a variety of fields since the 1880s. Uh, however, in terms of astrophysics, they've helped model a variety of things like uh, time delays, rotational periods, binaries, etc. Since 2014, however, they've become more involved in exoplanetary science, uh, helping to determine physical aspects, population, detections, and um, transit and RV data. Overall, GPs have actually proven to be better than the methods listed below. So what exactly am I fitting with these GPs? So calcium-2 H and K absorption lines correspond directly to stellar activity. Uh, these are the lines that form in the upper parts of the chromosphere and are sensitive to changes over time uh, in regards to the magnetic fields. Uh, the strength of the emission of these lines is centered and is called the S value. And again, that's our focus, the S value. It's calculated by ratioing the flux in these fields versus uh, their continuum band passes, as seen here, right? And our H and K lines are noted here. Uh, very fun fact, really cool nerd fact, is um, <laughs> Our S value was actually first formulated and used extensively at the Mount Wilson Observatories, which is still active to this day. So here's a simple example of a basic plot of real actual data uh, relative to one of our three uh, stars in our sample. Um, the black points shown here, scattered, are uh, 
actual data points with respect to time. Uh, the x-axis is modif modified Julian days, uh, so basically in the 2000s of the Gregorian calendar. Um, the s values, which I referenced in the last slide, uh, these are just a range, and as we see, they're scattered with respect to time. Um, but let's take a step back in our understanding. So a Gaussian distribution is basically a bell-shaped probability curve. See the bell shape. Uh, we're going to look into uh, Dr. Haywood's thesis um, in terms of how he apply, how she applied um, Gaussian process to blue birds. Uh, data regards to blue birds with regards to their weight and their wingspan. Uh, so relative to this 1D Gaussian, we see that it's expected, it's highly likely actually, to expect a bluebird to have a weight of 11 grams with a standard deviation of two. However, if we look relative to these two distributions, um, here we see um, a measure of like intuition, right? So if we were to intuitively think about this, right, um, for a bluebird, we'd expect, given a certain knowledge of weight, we should expect a certain knowledge of uh, wingspan. So this is a less constrained uh, Gaussian, and this is a tighter constraint. And basically, the significance of this one is if we better know our weight, uh, we could better determine our wingspan. So the same idea applies here. However, it's extended towards five uh, birds, and they're represented in different colors. Uh, these are one and the same in terms of 2D Gaussian. Uh, this is elliptical. This is linear, but again, one and the same. Um, but let's extend our, our, our idea here to uh, further dimensions, uh, essentially more parameters. So maybe we could take into account uh, amount of feathers, flight speed, beak color, bird color, et cetera. The point is, is once we try to measure one variable, let's say wingspan, we could better constrain our distribution, better constrain our parameters, and have a more realistic expectation of what they can't be as well as what they can. Furthermore, what's really exciting about Gaussian processes is that they could actually be applied uh, to infinite, infinite dimensional data sets, so that's pretty fun. Um, going back to our earlier examples, um, we could basically relate this to an uh, n-dimensional um, Gaussian, uh, where n is the number of observations. Therefore, we have n-dimensional Gaussians to actually fit. Uh, something to consider, however, is that even though more data is really good to determine better fits, at the same time, it's a double-edged sword. What I mean by that is it's very computationally expensive. So if uh, we have larger data sets, we should actually expect um, like big O3, so it's just gonna be very expensive in terms of the processing. Um, so let's look at the formal definition of a Gaussian process, right? So basically, a Gaussian process models covariance amongst multivariate data, uh, describing the strength of relationship between the data, um, data points that are nearby each other relative to time or space. Our focus, again, is on time. Um, again, we're using GP to map the correlation of stellar activity to our time series. Our broader goal is to characterize these points to essentially find out how and why they relate to one another. So fundamentally, there are different types of GP kernels. Uh, those basically model the variation between adjacent points in the time series. Uh, I have listed three out of several. There are a lot of different types of kernels. Um, as you can tell, uh, depending on the kernel you choose, the oscillation uh, varies. Um, each kernel is dependent on its own hyperparameters. Uh, these hyperparameters help shape the function and control how well the GP represents your data. Uh, some hyperparameters are shown here, like sigma and L, L being a length scale, and ba they basically uh, affect different aspects of your model. So hyperparameters, let's continue our understanding of that by focusing on the squared exponential um, kernel. So the L term that I was mentioning earlier uh, refers to the length scale. And basically, what that really means is how much wiggles you have in your function. So right here, we have actually a smaller uh, L term. Um, and it gives you a crap load of wiggles. Um, but if you look here, you have fewer wiggles. They're more broad. Also, what's it's not just the basis of how much wiggle there is, but the fact that it's relative to the same scale in your x and y axes. That's very significant. What's interesting about this is that this is just one hyperparameter alone. So 
one hyperparameter alone can have a drastic effect in terms of how well your kernel actually fits your data. So you want to pick good ones. So our methods. So we picked uh, three stars from the Keck high res survey. They differed in terms of the amount of data points with respect to time. The Keck high res survey basically used RV, the RV method in order to detect exoplanets. Uh, we used the George package via Python uh, to measure correlations of the GP fits. We changed our hyperparameters and kernels accordingly until these were actually optimized relative to the maximum values of our likelihood outputs. So now our analysis act is actually threefold. We have GP fits to consider, corner plots, and likelihood. So qualitative GP fits. Um, just from visual inspection alone, you could tell this one looks better than that one. Here's why. Black data points are actual legit data points. The red line measures the predicted mean of the data. As you could tell here, this is more smooth, more periodic, whereas this one's super jaggedy. Uh, also, the green represents the, vari the predicted variation for the data. This is too broad. This is more focused and centered uh, relative to the mean. So in general, we want more of this, less of that. And as you could tell here, squared exponential as a kernel choice actually ended up being a better choice relative to this for this star. So hyperparameter relationships. Uh, again, we're talking about correlation here. Correlation ship here? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the hyperparameters for uh, our squared exponential are listed here in both axes. We generated these, uh, this plot, it's called a corner plot. It's from the MC package, again, Python. Uh, the diagonals right here represent a normal distribution, again, which is ideal. Uh, for the non-diagonal plots, uh, we have a centered, darkened region. We do not want those regions to be sparse, uh, to, to be too spread out and less darkened, because that would imply our hyperparameters aren't as constrained as they could be. We want them constrained, so again, this type of plot is more ideal. So likelihood. By likelihood, I basically mean how probable is it that our choice of kernel, our choice of hyperparameter, actually fits the data we give it. Uh, so this was computed with a lot of, a lot of Python. That's all I got to say. <laughs> uh, our kernels uh, are listed here with the stars, so three different stars, several different ker kernels, some concerning white noise and otherwise. Um, our fun value was actually a likelihood output uh, from the George package, and our BIC value uh, is the overall thing we're analyzing with respect to the delta BIC. Uh, the point is the BIC value takes into account the sample size of your data, the amount of hyperparameters you have, and your maximum log likelihood, that being your fun value. Overall, we want a lower BIC value per star in order to determine that that said kernel fits the star the best. So our final conclusions are this. Uh, periodic and per periodic with and without white noise or the worst fits uh, for our stars. Uh, rational quadratic with and without white noise uh, seem to be the best fit so far. Um, what's also significant is that squared exponential for the one star, which is this one, wh which has the least data points, actually proved to be the best, um, or second best from my recollection. Um, what's really cool about that is that rational quadratic is basically a super kernel. That's not a legit term, but I'm hoping it will become that way. Um, it's basically a combination of a bunch of squared exponential kernels combined together with varying length scales. Um, further thing that we're looking into as of now is our hyperparameters. Uh, we need them to be reevaluated in the sense that some of them are more constrained than others. We're still actually trying to understand the physical interpretation of such hyperparameters. So our next steps is we want to apply the same, the exact same methodology towards uh, H alpha. H alpha is, again, similar to the S value in that it's a measure of strength relative to your stellar activity, mag magnetic fields and whatnot. Um, we want to see how similar this, like our outputs would be relative to our uh, S value fits to the H alpha fits. We're hoping they're similar, that's the hope. Um, our last step would be applying the RV data of the same uh, stars. Uh, we have two different methods. We're leaning this one. Um, the main point of it all is basically to extrapolate whether or not um, our entangled uh, 
signals are exoplanetary. Um, and again, to be very confident with our constraints within one sigma. So I would like to thank the following people. Uh, Shannon, Chris, I really needed the help for Python, so thank you. Um, Andrew, Jeff, Gwen, thank you for all the revisions uh, for the papers. Um, Johanna, lots of amazing uh, clarification in my emails <laughs> um, and just over overall concepts. And thank you to all the interns who have supported me and revised things. Okay, so the, in terms of hyperparameters, uh, we were actually using the MC package. Both uh, were produced by Dan Foreman Mackey. Forgot to say that. Um, we didn't do anything by hand with regards to that. Um, it was more or less simple calculations. Okay, so it was, it was MC and that did Yes. Mm -hmm. So what's known about the Hmm. That is a great question. Um, I'm not too sure about that. Um, I could get back to you. Any other questions? All right. Great job. Thank you.